So welcome to Hope Intervention 10. Thanks for being here. Today we're going to talk about scaling hope. So I'm going to share my screen and do my usual schedule. So this is all brought to you by the Institute for Love and Time or TILT. You can go to loveandtime.org slash hope intervention to learn more and see past videos. So today we'll be talking about scaling hope and this is the agenda for the day. I'll give about nine minutes of, I'm hoping maybe less, but we'll see if I can do it. Nine minutes of uh, discussion of the Time Travel Narratives Project, which is a project funded by the Robert, largely funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and that we're very excited about. Then we'll do a meditation with Mike, uh, with Dr. Sapiro, <laughs> healing. Um, I have here healing with the long body and time. I think this is an extension of that. I think he's doing something about a matrix, but I'm not sure. Um, so we'll see what happens there. Then we have I'm super excited Amber Williams, the lead user interface designer for the Time Travel Narratives Project will be our special guest. Then we'll do some Q&A in the chat window. I'll have the chime at 29 minutes. And at the end, we'll have a how you can help summary statement and homework. And I just wanted to point out that we're winding down these hope interventions. Um, we'll probably have about two or three more and they'll probably be focused mostly on special guests. So this is a, a day that I'm very excited about because we'll be talking about this project that is near uh, and dear to my heart. So just to review from Hope Intervention 1, uh, we know from a bunch of research that people who are mentally healthy have a strong future orientation, which is the scientific word that is most, uh, most akin to what we call hope. So it's a robust experience of looking into the future and feeling positive about it. And people who are not mentally healthy tend to have a weak future orientation. People who have a high socioeconomic status have a strong future orientation on average and people who don't of course have a weak future orientation it's hard to be hopeful about the future if you're struggling to get food or health care right now people who have societally acceptable addictions like phone addictions seem to be okay but if you have a societally not acceptable addiction like a pill addiction or a, a illegal drug addiction tend to have a weak future orientation People who are physically healthy, while you're physically healthy, you're able to see and feel positive about the future further out. Uh, but if you're feeling sick, that actually starts to close in on you and you can only, you can only feel like, oh, I'll be sick forever. So you can't see past that often, not always. People who are connected to community tend to have a strong future orientation and people who are less connected tend to have a weak future orientation. So a bunch of data supports what I just said, but it also supports that your connection with your future self, your actual psychological relationship with your future self can actually be strengthened with practice and that ends up increasing your future orientation or your sense of hope or your sense of future time perspective, regardless of your circumstances. So even if you're still in a state of being sick or you're still in a state of feeling lonely or mentally ill, Still, you can increase your future orientation or hope with the practice of connecting with your future self. And we've been working on that for the past several months, doing practices and homeworks about that. And the evidence is that that improves well-being and people in this group have seen how, how that has been the case or has not been the case for themselves. We haven't done a study on that in the group. It's just been anecdotal, but it seems like people are having a positive experience. And that's backed up by data. So that's what we know. And we've been talking about this kind of situation where as time goes on, the ups and downs of your life, which are like this black line here, everyone has these ups and downs, are, can be mitigated by, if this is the present moment, if this triangle is the present moment, by collapsing the feeling of the past, present, and future into the present moment so that you feel more extended over time. You feel more like this red, oblong, circle this long body that we talked about over time and that can increase your well-being so that it only dips a little bit even when your life circumstances are going down a lot you're bringing in information 
or you're, it's more like not, not really information. It's more like you're bringing in the awareness that your life is long and that it contains the past, present, and future. And you're loving yourself at all those time points. You're not just bringing in the information. You're, you're applying unconditional love to your experience in the past, present, and future. And you're carrying that with you even as your life circumstances go down, which inevitably they do, and, and then go back up, which inevitably they do. So that creates this well-being curve that's much it's like a shadow of this experience down here. So how can we scale this? So introducing the Time Travel Narratives Project. So our goal in this project is to close the future orientation gap in the United States. So that gap between all those factors, those five factors we talked about, between rich and poor, between lonely and connected, between mentally healthy, mentally not healthy. Everyone goes through one of those phases in their life. So it's really a future orientation gap in circumstance. So to close that by creating a scalable time travel narrative technology, what does that mean? Something that actually makes people feel like they can travel in time and meet these different parts of themselves and make that a habit so that over time, it can close the future orientation deficit. There's evidence suggesting that when you ask someone to write a letter from their future self or a letter to their past self, that they then read later and realize how compassionate they were when they were talking to their past self, or that they realize how loving and connected they feel to their future self. To the extent that, you can, that people can do that, it seems to boost their future orientation. It boosts their hope. So we want to repeat that in technology. So the plan is to provide volunteers who are at the intersection of addiction, abuse, trauma, poverty, and incarceration with a time machine. So everything can be solved with a time machine. Um, ask volunteers to use it for 20 days and then track their changes in physical, emotional, and spiritual well-being. And we want to ask for feedback from them and iterate the time machine design and the functionality based on their feedback. So basically we want to Look at the experimental results, look at the feedback from the people who can most benefit from this kind of technology and make something that can help them and that they like. So I am super excited to bring to you uh, Amber Williams, who created this design and is creating the design for, and the user interface design for the entire uh, technology that we're creating. And uh, she has excellent ideas um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen so I can be effusive a little bit, but she has excellent ideas. She has brilliant intuition and she is, yeah, beautiful design. I agree. And she is, um, a star of our team. And so I want to introduce you to her, to her, to you and you to her so that she could speak about, uh, time travel, her own experiences and what it's like to make a time machine. So, Amber, let's get you on. I'm unmuting you right now. Welcome. Uh, hello. Hey, and Michael, do you want to unmute your microphone or can you? I'm unmuting you. Got it, thanks. So thanks for being here. Do you want to just start off with what it's like to make a time machine or do you want to start off with some of the background or how would you like to start? Um, just, uh, I guess I'll start off with like a couple sentences about myself and like, I guess that all wraps into, um, designing the time machine and my own thoughts on, uh, connecting with myself over time. Um, all right. So do I just begin? Mm -hmm. Go okay. crazy. <laughs> um, so, uh, first, um, this project technology that improves uh, health productivity and, and performance really inspires me. I love to create harmony between people and technology. Um, I'm a designer and I'm also a photographer and I feel like I practice time travel through photography. Um, photography kind of causes you to look at a moment more carefully. And I think being a photographer for years and years, I've collected like these little stamps of the past. Um, and while a photograph is not a memory, uh, it serves as sort of an anchor for memories. And I can't exactly articulate it, but um, the, like, the relationship, I, I can't exactly articulate the relationship between memory and time, but it wouldn't make sense to me if there wasn't one. Um, uh, 
when I did shoot photography, I shot action sports. And because things were so active, um, I would often say like, uh, my camera would see it before I do. Mm. And I look back on those photographies and or, or, I look back on those photographs and I see all these people and all these emotions and all this like, all this activity just happening in the background. And it kind of like, puts the collective into perspective and how the a collective is when you think of time and not just time for yourself, but time for everyone. Um, I guess it's kind of like the human condition. Um, and so that all kind of plays into me and like how I go about designing for the time machine. Um, when I plan for the future, um, I, I do it by like, or when I connect to the future, I do it by making plans. For me, connecting with my future self is planning to get things that no one can take away from me, is planning to have security, is planning to have education, um, collective knowledge and building hope through education and community investment or the collective. Um, I think uh, a huge part of this or the three things that I pull from the most when I'm designing for this is um, intuition, familiarity and empathy. Um, intuition because like um intuition and familiarity because of my connections to like um i guess like learning to future orient um empathy because of like again just like my uh, i think my ability to think about more than myself in time but everyone else um i believe that part of planning for the future is interpreting the present and also thinking of the past um and when I'm designing, I'm thinking about an end user who might have difficulties thinking about the future because of what's going on in the present or what has happened in the past. Um, to kind of go back to photography, a photograph that I think about because of the story attached to it um, is from 9-11. Uh, there was a photo called The Dust Woman. And it's a picture of a woman who is exiting the lobby of the Twin Towers and she's covered from head to toe in dust. Um, I looked at the story of that photo and I found out that the woman who was in that photo was a recovering drug addict. Um, she had just gotten custody of her children like a year or so before because she had lost them before. And, um, and she just started the job at the bank and then this huge horrible thing happened and it ended up with her becoming, going back into addiction and kind of losing everything again. And, um, and like, I often wonder, like, you know, like, how hard was it for her to, like, get back into a place where she could actively think about the future? And so, like, this project kind of brought all those memories of, like, mm -hmm. the way I felt about that photograph back. So um, something I constantly think about it when I'm doing this project is uh, when does someone need hope and how do you engage with someone who is mm -hmm. hopeless? Um, I think I have a felt sense and a sensibility of, like, what someone who lacks hope might need. And like, um, just kind of trying to put all of that into this uh, project. It feels like you are putting it into the project. Yeah. I, I mean, yeah. S sorry, Mike, did you want to say something about that? No, I'm just, wow, wowing. <laughs> yeah, wowing. <laughs> yeah, that's, this is why I'm so excited Amber's is leading the user interface design because it seems like Amber, you put your, you, you model the mind of the user and mm -hmm. then you, and then you ask yourself, it's like, it's like you, you already know how to travel in time. So you're also traveling in space, right? You're putting your, you're, you're putting your attention on the mind of the user. And then that question about when could someone use hope? Do you have thoughts about that? Um, do you have thoughts about what it takes for someone to have an intervention from the outside and actually have it be helpful? Um, you know, if someone like even this technology, like what, what place do they have to be in? Because I know there are certain places where it's like, are you kidding me? Um, and there's other places where it's like, okay, maybe I'm open to this. What do you think the difference is? Um, I think you, I think um, getting a reaction, a reaction like, are you kidding me comes because of like actual time in the day. Like, I feel like when hope comes to you, like it's never an interruption unless like I'm in a meeting and my phone went off. You know, something like that. Um, I think about like when I first started this project, Julia actually had me do an um, exercise where 
I was to connect with myself somehow over time. And what I did was I sent, I, I went to Google, I wrote an email to myself and I put a random time to schedule it to send out. Um, when I actually got that email, I had forgotten I sent it mm. and it felt really good to like, just to see those words coming from myself. And it was really uh, strange how um, relevant it was to the moment and it seemed mm. to come out of nowhere, but I also planned for it. Um, so like, I, I, I believe that like, there's always time for hope. Um, but like, uh, when it comes to the user, we just have to be really aware of like where they might be or their state at, in the actual physical world when that hope arrives. Because that, that could be like the only intrusion. So um, someone did ask like if I could give an example of what I'm working on. So I am the UI designer for this project, but I'm also like doing lots of uh, UX heavy work. So I think what I'm working on is like kind of like putting myself in the user's shoes and making um, our application easy to use, intuitive, um, fun to use, uh, like pleasing to use, to look at. And, um, and I, it also has to make sense. It can't be like an overload. Like you don't want to feel drained by trying to actually help yourself. So that's the, I hope that answers the question. Um, so UX is um, user experience. UI is user interface. So user experience is um, how the user interacts with the uh, app that you're making. Um, it's uh, everything to like where it's all, it's where the buttons would be. Um, getting the user to use the app the way that they should. Um, it's kind of like you're the map maker or the you you plan the route for the user to take. The UI is making sure it is visually understandable for the mm -hmm. user so that they do those things that the UX is planned to do. So, so that, cool. mm. That's awesome, thank you. And you know, I noticed I did a little time travel and I mm -hmm. was talking about going into the meditation and then I went straight into Amber. Um, and I kind of feel like, Amber, you're so um, like beautiful. Full of life. <laughs> What's the word? Beautiful? Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. full of life and, and yeah. great ideas. But I kind of want to keep rolling with this. Are other people mm -hmm. letting go of the meditation today and, and just asking Ember questions? Um, because I am. Yeah, Julie and I talked and we're both uh, very happy with letting Amber keep rolling. And you guys are interacting with Amber too. Yeah, Tom said, if someone says effervescence. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're all trying to find words that. <laughs> explain why you seem to shine um, so brightly mm. i really appreciate the kind words <laughs> thank you um how do you give someone an experience using technology i've done vr and uh where you're embedded into the experience and we have data that suggests that it changes our biology it changes the neurology and changes behavior once we do some kind of meaning uh, making experience in VR. Can you do something like that with the technology you're creating for this program where someone really has an embodied experience? Um, I think that all goes down to just like how it functions and if it functions in a way that makes sense. So like the usability of it. Um, I'm trying to think of an app that, so like when it comes to user experience, um, you just wanna make, you wanna take people from a negative state and put them in a positive state after they use your technology. I feel like they come to the technology for a reason. And um, as long as they're able to easily like um, to meet their purpose, then they'll have this like positive reaction. Mm. Um, so imagine like, you know how like you'll walk up to a door and you'll push it when you should have pulled it. Most people push that door because there's two handles on it. There's a flat one and a pull one. And most people will think to just push the, the flat handle. And um, it's frustrating when you try to open a door and it won't open. So right away, the user is frustrated. They've had a negative experience because the design is, is not right. Mm. Um, right away, that user might think like, oh, I'm such an idiot. I didn't pull this door, but it's not their fault. It is the door. And um, when you're designing experience, you just want to make sure you you don't have that. Like a person comes to your technology for a purpose. You want to make sure if it looks like they can push the door open, the door opens and they're able to serve their purpose. 
Mm -hmm. um, so with the Time Machine app, it's a little different because it's not just like, you know, I have this like goal. I'm not going shopping. I'm connecting with myself. Um, and so that that is the that is also the challenge. So back to those questions, you know, like, you know, how do I engage with someone who is hopeless is also the challenge of like figuring out um, where within a technology like this can those um, those frustrations occur. I feel like as it is, I think the I think what Julia came up with is great. And I feel like it's so straightforward and um, it's easy to just like, it's easy to, it's easy to do. And like, I feel like when you're doing it, um, results will come if you do things every day. So no matter what the results will come. So. Hmm. You might want to scroll up. There's a few questions up there. Oh, sorry. I just kind of. Oh, no, 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 no. Okay. Um, yes, this is going to be a phone app. And um, uh, so the novelty, do you think the novelty, um, I think it will appeal to people, but I think what's going to be more appealing to people is that um, the people who come to this app to like, because they feel as though they need to change and need to be better, um, it will appeal to them because like, again, like it's something so special about receiving a kind word from yourself in the middle of the day or at the end of the day or to like have to think about talking to yourself. It also makes you think about the language that you use. And like these wellness checks, like it's also measurable. There's a metric. So now it's not just like, am I doing better? Like you will like, there's ways to see that you are like becoming better. So I think that's gonna be um, super appealing to the user base. Um, yeah. Um, I hope that answered your question. Um, so, um, hmm. Uh, time travel and religious views. I don't know. I don't know. I don't think I'm prepared to <laughs> answer that question. Um, yeah. Oh, Sorry. No, I mean, we're we're definitely making sure that um, we don't bring anything religious into the app. So. Yeah. Um, Sorry about that. I'm not exactly sure how to answer that one. Um, um yeah, uh, I'm, I'm guessing that this, so this question is about um, how this app could, um, how the concept translates into other languages. Um, I definitely feel like it sh it should work the same across all languages. Um, let's see. Are you? I wonder if that question is asking more about the concepts within a language that different cultures have different relationships to time travel, to hope, and things like that. I don't know if that's specifically what it's asking. But when I lived in Thailand, I had to re reframe the way my mind worked in terms of mental health and spiritual health. I had to go within the culture to understand the culture rather than impose my views on it to try to help people. So I wonder if there's a way, if you're going to work with, uh, we're working with various cultures, how do you adapt? The, uh, that's, that's what I read the question in a sense, actually. Yeah. Um, so that that's definitely something that will come up as we like start to engage more with our users and have them use the app. I feel like um, I won't get a sense of like um, I won't get a sense of any one's culture or how their language will play into it until like we spent more time um, with them and the technology. Mm -hmm. um, there was a question about game design. Can it be brought to needy people in that context? So game, games definitely uh, contain lots of UX thinking. Um, I feel like more so than most things, especially the way video games are today or any kind of game, um, like they're more intricate. They're like, they're made for longer play and more like depth and uh, more thinking. So um, UX is definitely a part of game design. Um, so, um, 
in our application, the user is guided to um, record messages to themselves, uh, kind of using like a voice memo feature on their phone. Um, they'll record a message, they'll send it to themselves, they'll receive those messages and play them within the app. Um, they'll get those messages throughout the day. Uh, and the same with like uh, wellness checks and inspirational quotes and things like that. So. Um, yeah, there, uh, there's also like a kind of like a prompting and a coaching piece to it to help the user to remember to think positively about the messages that they're sending to themselves and um, to not, you know, inject ne negativity into the future. Uh, so, um. Um, I'm not uh, familiar with quantum randomness. So there's a question about quantum randomness. Um, so if Julia or Michael, you all know what that is, I could probably um, answer that question. Sure. Um, I don't think we're worried about that in this particular app. I think I'm not worried about it, but I don't think that's, that may be something we do for fun. So quantum randomness allows a truly random and potentially in, influenceable source of randomness. So. Um, it might be fun to sort of think, oh, did I have a synchronicity? Did that inspirational quote or did my message come at a time when I perfectly needed it? So that one might be really fun. Right now we're working on the first year of the basic design, so we're not thinking about that. So I'm sure next year I'll be thinking about that mm -hmm. and so will Amber and others. So <laughs> we're sort of uh, step by step here. Um, there's a, just so you know, there's a question here um, actually yeah. from my mom. <laughs> um, <laughs> Mom, we I did a really brief overview of of what the what the app is, so I could talk to you about that later. All right, um, I just want to wrap up by saying thank you to Julia and Michael for um, allowing me to come and speak at the Hope Intervention, and thank you all for listening and your questions and uh, also the kind words that you all gave. So. Mm. Thank you so much. Really, really exciting. Really, really exciting. Thanks for being here. Mm -hmm. And this is the first time we just didn't do a meditation because we were just like, all right, mm -hmm. <laughs> we'll do that another time. We got we to gotta hear more. <laughs> Thank you. I'm really excited that Amber, such heartfelt, uh, present person is working on this this project, uh, because we can all get a sense now of the depth of love that you have for humanity that's going into a technology that will radiate that same love to all the users. So I'm really glad all of us today got to see that how the heart plays a role in healing technology. Um, because at times technology can seem sterile and sometimes heartless, but here's where the heart is uh, put into the work. So thank you for demonstrating that. So you're Thank part you. of that too, Michael. Oh, I forget sometimes. <laughs> you're I'm on just the team too. Screens right? right now, right? Totally. And everyone on the, uh, everyone who comes to these hope interventions is part of it because you're feeding oh, into it. Yeah, yeah. But Amber, yeah, I agree. You're 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 special. You're a special channel. You're a special channel for love. Mm. Sorry to to uh, cut off your compliment, Michael. Oh no, that's great. I'm glad you added to it. <laughs> All right, here I'm doing the dinging. And then I wanted to share my screen and let you know how you can help this project because we definitely need your help. Um, how can you help? So you'll, oh, look, I, we get to go through all these before I, <laughs> before I get to that slide. So what we really need in this project, and then mom, you get your description, here we go. What we really need in this project is volunteers at the intersection of addiction, abuse, trauma, poverty, and incarceration who are interested in making a little bit of money to do a lot of good. So they'll get paid for their time in this project. So the request is to pass along the, the link to the flyer that you're going to receive in the follow-up email today. You can also just screenshot this link right now to any mental health clinics, clinicians, or clients you think would be um, interested in participating. So the summary statement for today, hope is learning to identify with and unconditionally love that strong and graceful silver thread running through the ups and downs of your life while accepting the present and working towards a positive future. It takes practice and this practice may be scalable. So the homework each day, visualize that strong silver thread connecting your present, past and future selves 
like beads on a string. Try loving the whole ensemble, no matter what. So thank you so much, everyone, especially Amber. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next week. See you next week. Have a wonderful week. <laughs>